Welcome back. In this muscle physiology video, what we'll look at is the role of excitation and contraction coupling. Uh, we'll look at the role of calcium in the regulation of muscle contraction, and we'll look at the role of ATP in muscle contraction. So in the previous video, we looked a lot at uh, the structure of the thick and thin filaments, but we didn't talk a lot about their function. So here in uh, diagram A, what you see are typical uh, thin and thick filament. So we see our actin molecules, our double helical strand. We see our tropomyosin band here, which is blocking the myosin binding sites on the actin molecules. And you see troponin, uh, which is attached to this uh, tropomyosin band. And it regulates the orientation of that tropomyosin band. And um, so in this scenario, in scenario A, we have low cytosolic calcium, so a low concentration of calcium in the cytosol of the muscle. In scenario B, we have high cytosolic calcium. So when we have a high concentration of calcium available in the cytosol, calcium regulates muscle contraction by binding to troponin. So troponin is so named, it's a three-protein complex, which regulates the orientation of the tropomyosin band in relation to the myosin binding sites on actin. So when calcium binds to troponin, it causes a conformational change, so a change in structure in that the tropomyosin band, which in the resting state is blocking the myosin binding sites on actin, it now moves to uh, make those binding sites available to actin or to myosin. And what you see here are the myosin heads then begin to interact with those myosin binding sites on actin. And that forms what we call a cross bridge. So these are sometimes called cross bridge binding sites. Uh, and this is how we can generate force, which allows the muscle to shorten and contract. So calcium is very important in the regulation of muscle contraction. So how do we regulate calcium, or how do we uh, fluctuate between uh, low cytosolic calcium and high cytosolic calcium? So when a muscle receives a, an electrical stimulus, uh, such as an action potential, it receives that action potential, um, and that's translated through the uh, sarcolemma, um, which is the plasma membrane uh, surrounding the muscle fiber. Um, and that... Uh, Within these structures here, so if we look at a couple of muscle fibers here, um, what we see is this mesh-like structure um, around the, the fibers, which are known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Here's my sarcolem or my muscle fiber plasma membrane. And these other structures here, uh, denoted in purple, which are known as the transverse tubules. And they allow the depolarization coming from this electrical stimulus uh, to come within close proximity of the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, where calcium is actually stored uh, to stimulate uh, calcium release. So this mesh-like structure, which I mentioned a moment ago, is known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, it is effectively a sac, um, a storage point or storage depot for calcium. There's calcium is in high concentration within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, it has close proximity um, to, the, to the filaments of the muscle fiber, um, and this is a mesh that allows calcium to diffuse readily to all those troponin sites um, which are bound to tropomyosin and would control the access to the myosin binding sites on actin and therefore help to regulate uh, muscle contraction. So what happens when we see, receive a, an electrical stimulus? So a muscle action potential is propagated along the, the muscle plasma membrane. It penetrates down into the muscle via these transverse tubules. Okay, and these transverse tubules are located in close proximity uh, to here. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is, is represented in blue. So that's our mesh-like structure, which is in close proximity to the, the filaments of the muscle. So we have a number of dihydropyridine receptors, known as DHP receptors, within the T-tubules, and they effectively act as voltage, center, voltage sensors and cause a conformational change. And they are linked to ryanodyne receptors, um, which are housed on the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. So here's our DHP receptor. So if, if we look closely here, here's our DHP and our ryanodyne receptors. Here's a, a little zoom in on these uh, particular structures. 
uh, which are bound, the ryanodium receptors are bound to the sarcoplasmic reticular membrane, and they act as a calcium channel, and they're gated by the dihydropyridine receptors, the DHP receptors. So when a DHP receptor senses a change in voltage associated with the electrical stimulus, uh, this causes a confirmational change in the ryanodine receptor, allowing this particular calcium channel to open. And calcium will diffuse down its concentration gradient uh, from its high concentration in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and out into the cytosol. Um, once uh, cytosolic calcium concentrations are high, uh, calcium will bind to the available troponin binding sites, and um, that will cause a, a structural change which will remove tropomyosin blocking of the myosin binding sites. And then what that will do is allow uh, myosin heads to interact with actin on their myosin binding sites to form a cross bridge uh, to enable uh, muscle contraction or muscle shortening. Um, this is a good summary slide, um, and this will be in the textbook that I uh, refer to um, on the module site. Um, so what you see here is from start to finish. So Here's your uh, motor neuron, which is linked to your muscle fiber. Okay, this is the motor end plate. So an action potential passes down the motor neuron and uh, causes release of a neurotransmitter known as acetylcholine. And um, this, these, this binds to the acetylcholine receptors at the motor end plate. Um, again, generating an action potential um, at the motor end plate. That propagates along the sarcolemma and down the T-tubules to penetrate into the muscle. These T-tubules are in close proximity to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Our DHP and ryanodine receptors uh, sense this change in voltage and effectively open calcium channels for calcium to be released into the cytosol. Once calcium is released into the cytosol, it binds to troponin, uh, removing tropomyosin, blocking of the myosin binding sites on actin, and this allows myosin and actin to interact to form a cross bridge um, which uh, results in, in contraction and shortening of the muscle. So this slide is a, is a really nice uh, summary image uh, of, of the process. Um, if we look at the cross bridge cycle itself, um, the other thing we require in addition to calcium is we require some energy. So as we know adenosine triphosphate or ATP is the energy currency of, of the cell. So our in, when we have ATP available, um, it binds to the myosin head. Um, and what you have is cocking of the myosin head in its, in its high energy form. You have hydrolyzation of that ATP into adenosine diphosphate and, and an inorganic phosphate. And it's the breaking of the bonds between those and the release of the associated energy. And that's the energy that we use um, to fuel what we would call the power stroke, which is the movement of the myosin head. So earlier I referred to um, the positioning of the myosin head in that it's pointing away from the midline of the sarcomere. So here we see binding um, of our myosin and actin because the myosin binding site is available on the actin due to calcium being bound to troponin and tropomyosin blocking of those sites uh, being removed. Um, we break up that bond between adenosine uh, diphosphate and inorganic phosphate and the energy that we, we release there is used to fuel the power stroke. So you can see here the orientation of the, the myosin head here and you can see what's happened here in the power stroke. It's moved in the direction of the arrows here um, to your left on the screen. And what it does is it pulls the thin filaments towards the center or towards the midline. And as we know from... Uh, the previous video, what that does is it brings the thin filaments closer together, it reduces the size or the diameter of the eye band, and it also reduces the H zone, and effectively we have shortening of the sarcomere and shortening and contraction of the muscle. At this point, ADP is released, uh, and what we now have is um, a myosin head in, in what would be considered its low energy form, and at this point it's in rigor. Um, so it is quite stiff, and it's, it's actually uh, physically bound to actin, and it requires ATP to be released, so it requires a new energy source to be released from this particular bind. So when ATP uh, binds to the myosin head, we have unbinding of myosin and actin, uh, and we effectively go back to the start.
we hydrolyze that ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. We've cross bridge formed and we use the energy from those bonds to fuel the power stroke and so on as the cycle goes on. So we need, in summary, we need two things um, to be available to us or in ready supply uh, to fuel contraction. Uh, one is we need high cytosolic calcium so that the myosin binding sites on actin are available to myosin and that a cross bridge can be formed. And the second thing that we need is ATP uh, to fuel that contraction. Um, if we just look briefly at the functions of ATP, so hydrolysis of ATP by myosin energizes the cross bridge and, and provides the energy for the force generation in the power stroke. Uh, the second function of ATP is the binding to myosin dissociates the myosin head uh, from actin, allowing the bridges uh, to repeat their cycle of activity. And then the final function um, for ATP in the whole process the hydrolysis of ATP by the calcium ATPase in the sarcoplasmic reticulum provides the energy for active transport of calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which lowers our cytosolic calcium uh, to pre-release levels. And that effectively ends the contraction because the myosin binding sites and actin are no longer available for a cross bridge to form. So you have to remember that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is high in concentration of calcium um, and therefore to get calcium to move from the cytosol back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum requires active transport and therefore requires energy and, and therefore it uses ATP.